We have been talking uh, lately about love, and uh, we talked two weeks ago about our first love and how important that is and how all of our life really flows from that first love, that, that relationship that we have with Jesus. Everything we do stems from that. Every, our, our, our growth, our maturity, our peace, our, our, our wellness, everything about who we are, our, our, our characteristics, uh, every, everything, the person that we become kind, good, becoming like Jesus all stems from having our first love in order with him, making Jesus our first love again. It's so important. We talked about that, and then we talked last week about love and what love looks like, and we went through 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and, we, and it was a good thing for us who don't know what love is supposed to look like, and this week, we're staying on the topic of love Look at somebody next to you and say, I still love you. I still love you. And, and so this week we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about love and marriage. Love and marriage. Now, Patty and I just celebrated our 38th wedding anniversary Thursday. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking two things. Jerry, did you get a trophy? No, I didn't. <laughs> Actually, she deserves a trophy. Number, number two is, what did y'all get married when you're 10? <laughs> Just about. It wasn't far from that, actually. We got married. I, I was 18. Patty's far older than me. As you, I was going to say, as you could tell, and you probably would have said, yeah, by the maturity level. But she, uh, she's six months older than me. She had already turned 19. So that excuse of, oh, we were young when we were married. Look. With Jesus, you can be young as you want to be. I, I told somebody earlier today, we didn't know much about anything. We thought we did, but you know what we did know? We knew that Jesus would take care of us as long as we stayed with him. And he will do that for you. So we want to talk about marriage today. Now, I understand that there are divorced people here. And I, I want to say to you, first of all, I want to say that I'm sorry that you've had to go through the pain uh, that, that's involved in that, and I, I am sorry. I'm thankful for God's grace and His forgiveness and His healing, and uh, it may or may not have been your fault, which is the way it works in divorce, but, but again, I'm thankful that His mercies are new every day, and Jesus would say to you the same thing that He says to everybody else. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. So pick your cross up and just start walking with him again. You may be remarried, uh, good for you. Just make this marriage with God's help to flourish and be the best marriage it can be. You keep walking with God. God offers forgiveness. Now let me say this, that's not a license to sin. If you're sitting right now thinking, good, I'm just going to throw my spouse away. Get rid of that thought that's of the devil. That's not of God whatsoever. Because that's not the way it operates. But if you've been through that, that terrible suffering, that trial of divorce, God brings help, hope, restoration, and healing and forgiveness. So I want you to stay with us during the sermon. Hopefully it will have something for everybody. And there are single people here I understand as well. Some single people uh, desire to be married. Some people, single people do not desire to be married. I would say to the single people, bloom where you're planted. Bloom in the situation that you're in right now. And to those who are desiring to be married, you may say, yeah, that's easy for you to say because I've got this great desire to get married. Well, let me tell you this, that um, God has a plan for your life. Whoa. I wish I had a nickel for every time I saw that on Facebook or, or um, Twitter or just said these days. Every time you hear that, God has a plan for your life, and we've even upped it a little bit, we call it destiny today, because it just sounds more cool, really. Can I, I once again want to tell you what God's plan and his destiny is for your life. You ready for this? You ready? God's plan and his destiny for your life is to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do that, he takes care of the rest. You see, what's happened in America is we've become more in love and, and maybe even chasing the ideal of our plan, 
that God has for us are chasing our destiny than we have been chasing God. You see, if you will chase God, He will put you right where you need to be. And it may not be going to work in a limousine every day. It may not be that. When we look back into the Scriptures, when we look at what happened to some of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth, when we look at Joseph, yes, Joseph ended up the second in charge of all of, uh, of Egypt, a great nation, but did, it was God's plan for him to go through jail. He was in prison. It was God's plan for his life to be a slave. What a destiny. That's my destiny. That's not really what we want, is it? Sometimes God's plan, plan for your life isn't always what you want at the moment. If you're single and you desire to be married, that just bloom while you're there. Seek God while you're there, and His plan will come about. The Apostle Paul was in jail as well, in prison. We would not have a lot of the Bible if Paul wasn't in prison. Neither, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you need to go to prison. I, I am saying... Neither one of those two actually did anything wrong. They, got, they were unrightly put in prison. But God's plan for you may be you're supposed to be at McDonald's or at the White House or at, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, TTMA or, or at Matauza or, or at Alcoa or in a school. And, and, that it's, and that's your plan because you bloom right there. Everybody can't be in the same spot. We all can't be Billy Graham. God has you in a place for a reason and a purpose. You let your light shine there. You let his plan unfold where you're at because he needs you there. He needs you there. Single people who, who are wanting a spouse, I want you to know that you're not alone either. Last Sunday night, this, this church prayed for you. On our Sunday night prayer meeting, we prayed that those that are single who are longing for a spouse, that the Lord would start sending spouses their way. We prayed that, and we believe God will do that. We do really do believe God will do that. We just want you to know that after you get him and the honeymoon's over, don't blame us, okay? So, but let's open the scriptures to Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9, and let's look at what... Uh, what marriage is supposed to look like. It'll be on the screen as well, and you can use your Bibles, you can um, uh, use your device if you want, whatever, but it reads like this. The Pharisees came up and to him, that would be Jesus, and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That's a cool verse right there, isn't it? Let me ask you this. If you want to know answers, do what Jesus said. Read. Have you not read? Read that book. Read the Bible. He said, have you not read? Have you not read? That's where you find the truth. That's a little lecture. I'm not going to charge for that little tidbit. And, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives but from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting here that it's, it's how it's flipped from Jesus and grace and truth saying you need to stay with your wife where Moses from the law, from the law that we always think is harder on us, said, okay, you can, you can divorce your wife, give her a certificate. That's funny. But God is saying, look, you need to stay with them, I except for uh, sexual immorality, being unfaithful. But also, some of you may know the scriptures in 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, there's, there's reason for abandonment and abuse as well. And if someone leaves, you, you let them leave. But that is 
the picture of marriage. One man, one woman for a lifetime. Today we call that traditional marriage. You could, you could pretty much call it biblical marriage or godly marriage. That is what marriage looks like. And it's a good thing. It's a great thing. God created it. Everything God creates is good like that. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It may or may not be in the Bible that it says, She who finds a husband has hit the jackpot. <laughs> Y'all have to see if that's in there for yourself. But uh, it's obvious that uh, marriage is under attack today. And I understand because marriage is a powerful weapon in God's hand. You know, one can put 1,000 to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. Couples, we'll get to this in a minute. But it's important to pray together. So important to pray together. So important. Um, if your children are having problems, I'm, I'm telling you, when mom and dad goes to their knees, two can put how many? To flight. How powerful is that? We need to remember to pray. Marriage is, is under attack today. Does anybody here know the divorce rate in America today? 50% that I hear? Going once, going twice, I'm practicing for the tea auction. But uh, it is 50%. In the church today, you know what it is? 50% as well. 50% as well. God never intended it for it to be that way because it brings so much hurt, so much pain, not only to the two that are involved, and many of you can attest to this, but it also messes up with your children's situations and grandchildren's situations. God never intended it to be that way. So let's, uh, let's look at marriage and let's, let's talk about a few things uh, that can keep us from getting divorced. Again, the enemy will attack you. Listen, there is no perfect marriage. I'm sorry, Patty. There is no perfect marriage. I thought Patty would say amen too, Shirley. You know why there's no perfect marriage? No perfect people. There's two imperfect people that are in that union. You know why there's no perfect church? No perfect people. Same thing in marriage. But God can get us through our imperfections. God can get you past. This is going to be good. Don't look at each other or anything. God can get you past your spouse's issues. Don't look at your spouse right now. He can do that. He can do that. God can get you past your spouse's issues. You know, the first thing I tell young couples when they come to meet with me um, about me officiating their wedding and they want some counseling, first I say, we're going to talk about the hard times, the, the times when you, we, you know, we have trouble because that's what you need to hear about. There's going to be many, many, many days of good times and you don't need me to help you in any way in those times. The same way with this message, we're going to talk about some of the things that trip us up instead of the good times that we have. Uh, the first thing, the first, then after I say that, I say immediately, if you're here, and Caleb and Kara can tell you, they're getting married next Saturday. Congratulations. I'll be here. Um, the first thing I say is this. If you've come into my office not thinking that this marriage is from now until we take our last breath or Jesus comes back, then don't get married. Because the devil will make sure he'll find a reason for you to get out of that marriage. Because there's no perfect people. You will find, you may not believe this, and I love you guys, but each of us have issues. We have our own issues, and at times we get angry, at times we get mad. At, at, at times I don't pick my underwear off the bathroom floor like I should. And that happens. But... But God will enable you to get through that. God will enable you to get through that. There, there really are issues. I just mentioned a small one. Some are small, some are large. 
and, and you have to press your way through. You see, we've come up with this idea by watching movies and TV that once you get married, and unfortunately, a lot of these shows over-romanticize relationships. Nothing wrong with some romance in your relationship, but they over-romanticize it, and they say things like, you complete me. If Patty's looking for me to complete her, she's in trouble. Okay, here's another pop quiz. Y'all love pop quiz. There's only one person that can complete you. Who is that? That is Jesus. That is Jesus. That person's not com- going to complete you. He's not going to make you whole. She's not going to make you whole. Those are issues. So you don't put your focus on that. You put it on him. Some people say, oh, man, this is going to. Some people say, I can't live without them. I understand what you're saying. You love them a bunch. But we can't live without God. But, but we, we'll survive as long as we have Him. Okay? So let's, let's don't over-romanticize them. Uh, some, some people, see, on, on the day of your wedding, man, you looking in their eyes, you see, them, you see your bride walk down that aisle, and it, it is a rush of great feelings. I mean, it's like, this is awesome. This is wonderful. You go on your honeymoon, everything's great. You have these great feelings. But ten years later, she backs the car into the garage door. And at the moment, you don't have the same feelings you had when you saw her walking down the aisle. Have you ever heard somebody say, well... I just fell out of love with them. I just fell out of love. Like you just fall out of love. You don't do that. You guys ever heard of Ravi Zacharias? He's a wonderful teacher of God in the church for today. He has a brother. Ravi's from India. He has a brother that's very intelligent. Ravi's Ravi's very intelligent as well. They're from India, and their customs are totally different than ours here in America. Ravi's brother got to the age of 25, and he told his dad to go pick out a bride for him. That's what they did. That's what they did. And so he goes, and and, and they're living in Toronto at the time. And um, so his dad works with his family in India, and uh, they, they choose him a bride, and they have him a bride. They send out the invitations. They, they have everything uh, planned, the wedding's planned, the engagement's happened, the wedding's planned, and they haven't even met each other yet. So Robbie, who didn't do it this way, he says, let me ask you a question, brother. What are you going to do when you get off the plane and she's standing there and you're thinking, oh, no, I hope that's her sister? <laughs> or, or, or she says to you, oh, no, I hope that's her, his brother. What do you do then? Cancel the whole thing? And Ravi Zacharias, all these years later, remembers what his brother said. His brother said to him, and this is so true to each of us today. So true to each of us today. But before I even tell you what he said, I want to tell you a scripture verse. 1 John 4.7. 1 John 4.7 says, let us love one another. Let us love one another. You get it? You get it? You can choose to love somebody. You can choose to love somebody. You get it? If you want to love somebody, you can love somebody. You can choose to love somebody. Ravi Zacharias' brother answered him this way. Love is as much a question of the will as it is of the emotion. And if you will to love somebody, you can. You can. God can restore, refresh, renew marriages. He can do more with your marriage than you ever dreamed if you will choose to let him do it. If you will choose to let him do it. We don't have time to talk about a whole lot of ins and outs of marriages today. But I do want to say this. There are four things that are hard to say that every marriage, every married person needs to learn to say. Four things. You ready for these four things? And some of these men, I'm sorry. 
Number one is, I was wrong. Number one is, I was wrong. Number two, I'm sorry. Number three, forgive me. Number four, this one's tough at times. I need your help. Those four things will keep your marriage strong. You've got to say them. Again, the enemy, it is so funny how sometimes it's so hard, and it's just, a, it's just the, the enemy's attacking your mind. It makes it so hard to say these kinds of things to the one you love the most. Why is that? Why is that? I'm glad you asked. Because there's an enemy of God who would love to see you guys part. Patty and I, and I really wasn't going to use her much today as sermon illustration. She started charging me 50 bucks every time. But we would get in disagreements. And disagreements can lead to arguments. Let me tell you how a fight starts. It's just, it's some part, one of the two people say one little thing Negative toward the other. It's like a boxing match. Somebody throws a jab. You get hit with the jab. What do you do? I'm going to fight back. You throw a jab back. Ooh. Next thing you know, somebody throws a hook. Boom. Well, ha, I'm going to throw a hook back. And the next thing you know, you're throwing haymakers. And by the end of the argument, you don't even remember what started it. And Patty would say, if you would have just came over and hugged me, it would have all been over with. And, and the man, I was thinking if I got within arm's distance, you would have punched me. <laughs> but I'm telling you, husband and wife, if you can grab each other's hand and begin to pray, even though that atmosphere is like a flame, not the Holy Spirit, and you'll begin to pray, I'm telling you, it will break the atmosphere. It will change. God will move. God will move. It's amazing. You know what? Everything God does is simple. Marriage is simple. Salvation is simple. Love is simple. But, all, but simple doesn't equal easy. Doesn't mean it's easy. Because there is an enemy. You have an enemy. You have an enemy. If you want to solve your problems, sometimes you have to lose the fight. In a happy marriage, a successful marriage, don't try to win the argument. Try to resolve your issues. Don't fix blame. Fix the problem. If you win the argument... If you win the argument and you don't fix the issue, your victory will be short-lived. It will be short. Do you want to be reconciled or do you want it to be right? Or Or do you want to be right? Your choice. Your choice. I'm going to lastly... Right before, lastly, I'm going to tell you, the enemy wants to break your marriage up. And you know what, how he does that is, uh, too? He wants you to look at the grass on the other side. At just the wrong time, the enemy may send Prince Charming or Princess Charming your way. Right when your husband and you've had a disagreement or something. Right when you're ready to trade in the old model for a new one. I'm telling you, guard your marriage. Prince Charming or Princess Charming, the grass may look greener on the other side, but when you get over there, you still got to mow it. And also, sometimes it looks greener because there's a septic tank right underneath of it. It's the same thing. You're just trading one problem for another. You just have to stand. You have to pray. You have to fight for your marriage. Is it easy, Jerry? No, it's not easy. Do you feel like Surrendering at times, yes, but never. You're going from death do you part till, till we part. And that's where you're going in your marriage. Lastly, I can say this. I have never witnessed, I have never witnessed two people who are legitimately seeking God first 
who've got their first love with Jesus in order, I have never seen them divorce. I can say I have seen church members divorce. I have seen ministry break up and have divorces. I have been close to those people, as a matter of fact. But if you take your eyes off of Jesus and wanting to please Him more than anything else in this world, here's another pop quiz. You ready? Who wants to please Jesus more than anything else in this world? Raise your hand. If you'll do that, your marriage will work. Your marriage will work. I have never seen a marriage where both parties are seeking Jesus and really want to do His will, really want to keep His word separate. The, so the most important thing is, is go back to your first love. Make sure you're right between you and Jesus. Everything's good. That's where it all starts. That everything else, God will teach you. God will train you. Yeah, you will learn stuff about your, your marriage. You will learn your wife. You'll get to know her. Each marriage is different. Each, each spouse is different. And that's what I've learned over the years. So you've got to pray. You've got to pray, Lord, show me how to, to help my spouse. Teach me. Show me her ways. And you know, if you pray that and you pay attention, he'll show you. He'll show you. It's that simple. He'll really show you. And you can have a flourishing relationship. Again, most days are great. The enemy does attack. But if you stay with the Lord, you fall to your knees, you seek him first, your marriage will survive and flourish if you keep your eyes on him.